agreed to share some of her wonderful stories with us today. Fran is a wonderful storyteller. <laughs> and we can all learn from listening to her stories. We can also advocate for music therapy and for the creative art therapies by retelling them ourselves. So in a pure tra uh, oral tradition, we are invited to listen. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, Avagat, which is the team of this uh, Congress, perfectly suits mm -hmm. Fran, mm -hmm. as you will hear in a few seconds. Fran, would you like to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> Can I say no now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get it out of your system. <laughs> oh, you said it. I did. Okay. Started as a music therapist in the 50s. Uh, yes, in the 50s in Canada, there were only three people two in Ontario, one in Saskatchewan, and we did not get more in until uh, some came from Quebec right around 1960, 62, and 3. In 1955, uh, I had been working with a little girl who had been called Crazy Polly. A little girl who sort of looked like this, but was bright. But the doctors all felt that she was being bullied and she didn't understand and that she really should be put in an institution for retarded children. Her father was a doctor. And he came across the street to where I lived, and he said, I know that you're doing music with kids. Will you work with her? And it was very strange working with this kid because she was very musical. And I started with the treble clef. And I said, okay, now put your hand out, and out comes the left hand. And repeatedly out came the left yeah. hand. So I went to the bass clef and I started to show you the bass clef and out came the right hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bit by bit, I got it straightened out. Eventually, teaching her the chord. She was a very musical kid, so she couldn't get stuff as soon as she heard it. But it changed her whole life. The doctor was so thrilled that his, his kid was coming along that he spoke to another doctor who was a friend of his, whose son had just died of muscular dystrophy. And when he told him about Polly, he said, well, there's nobody doing anything in this province with children who have muscular dystrophy. And it's because they're so difficult to handle. Difficult in the point of view, physically difficult. And do you think she would try to do something with it? So the man approached me. He was the vice president of the Canadian Music Therapy Association. Not Music Therapy, excuse me. Muscular Dystrophy. And wondered if I would do an afternoon with a group of kids who were in a place called the House the Home for Incurable Children. The title says it all. It says it's somewhere in the 19th century, and it's an orphanage, and it was, in many respects, fine, and in other respects, quite awful. So I went there one afternoon, and there were about 10 kids with muscular dystrophy. And what can you do with kids who are so involved that they can really not move. The last part of the body that is affected is the former. And this they had so that we could do a little bit of good work on very small instruments. And then I saw that they really wanted to try and do different things, and that's when I said, okay. Let's do some puppetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So on my hand, I can't do very much. You can still mm -hmm. be a puppet. Mm -hmm. And so we had the puppet singing and yelling and arguing. Mm -hmm. But we argued in numbers so that 
that nobody would be hurt. <laughs> and the kids were completely taken with the fact that they could do all of these things. At the end of it, contrary to what you wanted, because when I put down, they begged me to return. He said, no, that's too strong a word. They begged me to return. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, they had had such a good time, but more than that, it took them out of themselves. Mm. In this institution, like many institutions at that time, there was no choice of anything that a child could do. You had to eat what was put in front of you, wear what was put on the bed in front of you, and you had to go to everything you were told to do. You could not ever say no. And so, when the Muscular Dystrophy Association realized what was happening, they made um, an Arts Express, we called it, and children with muscular dystrophy from all over Toronto were brought in by firefighters and by the Red Cross for an afternoon where they would be in a gym area where they could do music, art, or drama, and move from one to the other. At the same time, as we set this up for every second Saturday afternoon in Toronto, I was asked by the Home for Incurable Children if I would teach them music teach them to do something they didn't know what they wanted. They wanted music. The uh, nursing head was a woman whose father was conductor of the Ottawa Symphony. So you know where she was coming from. And so I started with these kids. There were 42 of them, all in wheelchairs with the exception of two walkers. And this was a separate program. But the children uh, came down on one Saturday, and the first thing I said to them was, I think that we should get to know each other. And, uh, and I think that you should really have a choice as to whether you have or not. Little did I realize what I was getting into. <laughs> Well, 
how is it going? And all the kids said, we're not going to do it. And he said, well, I am. Even if they roll my bed on stage, I'm going to do it. And when they heard his determination, they changed. And they said, okay, we'll do it. But then the kids started testing the following Saturday. A few of them stayed up because they had a choice. Mm -hmm. For the first time in their lives, they had a choice. The nurses were outraged. They would have to look after two or three kids mm -hmm. upstairs. They couldn't do their work. And so on Monday morning, I am called down to the office to meet with the director. And she said, there are two things I have to discuss with you. First of all, you can't leave kids out. The nurses are too busy. <laughs> and I said, well, I think these kids should have a choice. I think it's important. They have no choice in anything whatsoever. And they will only test this for a week or two. They will walk up there. They will want to be there. No, 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 no. I said, well, I think that's the way it's done. She said, no, we can't have that. And I said, well, I guess I can't stay here. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, oh, oh, well. But the other thing is that you gave Clifford, who's going to die, you gave him a part in the show. And I said, yes. She says, take it away. I said, no, Clifford needs this part more than any other kid. He needs something to hold on to. He knows what's happening to him. Well, what happens if two weeks before the show he, he dies? I said, I'll look at it. And again, she said, we can't have that. And I said, well, I'll hand in my resignation right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was not to be. <laughs> Instead, we went into talking about the show, we decided we would do puppets to handle and grab. We were doing a wheelchair ballet to Swan Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and we were doing a little operetta with a mean old burgomeister. And the burgomeister 